I'm Craig Payne and what I'm going to be doing is taking you through a guide to foot orthotic prescribing. The first thing I'm going to want to do as part of this process is determine if the symptoms that the patient is presented with are actually amenable to foot orthotic intervention. So as part of the initial history and the initial physical examination, we're going to try and determine is this a mechanical problem or is this neurological or some other sort of problem that's not necessarily amenable to foot orthotic intervention. Once we've decided that foot orthotics are indicated, we're then going to want to undertake a number of clinical tests to derive what I call the prescription variables. So we'll do a clinical test and it will tell us what we do or don't want in the foot orthotic design. So we'll have a list of variables at the end of that assessment. The next step then is to take that list of variables and match that to design features in the foot orthotic device. And hopefully if they're matched up properly, um, the load and the forces in the tissue will be reduced, you know, the symptoms will be de decreased and the outcome for the patient will be better. The first test we're going to do is look at where the, where the subtalar joint axis is or an approximation of it. The reason we need to do that is that the, if the foot's pronating excessively and we want to try and stop that, we need to put a force on the medial side of that joint axis. The problem is that joint axis varies substantially from person to person, so we need to determine approximately where it is. So we're going to do that by just palpating around, looking for where the foot pronates and where the foot supinates. If I push here, I can see that foot's pronating, so I, I can afford to have an orthotic push there. If I push there, I'm getting no motion, so we don't really want an orthotic to push at that point. If I push up here, that foot's supinating, so we can have an orthotic push there. If I push there, I'm getting no motion, so we don't want it to push there. So you can effectively map out on the bottom of the foot where the joint axis is. And here it's slightly medial along this line here. So we have all this space here for a foot orthotic to push. So what we then need to do is match that up to the design features in the orthotic that it pushes on the medial side of that line that we've just mapped out. We don't want it pushing on it and we certainly don't want it pushing lateral to it. For, for example, if the joint axis was much more medially located and you only had a small space of, of the bottom of the foot to push on, you're going to need much more medial wedging and we want a much lower arch device because we don't want any pressure on the lateral side of the axis. If the joint axis was much more laterally located, you can have a much higher arch device because the arch of that device will still be on the medial side of the joint axis. Okay, the purpose of this next test is to evaluate the quality of motion at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. We want to know is there any structural or functional problems that might um, inhibit function or in, and interfere with the use of the foot orthotic. The obvious one is going to be the, the looking for a, a hallux rigidus or a structural hallux limitus. What is the range of motion available at the joint? The other one is the functional hallux limitus test, which is a little bit, a little bit controversial, um, primarily because it is, is quite difficult to do. And what we want to try and do is simulate the ground reaction forces. So we want to try and load up the first metatarsal head and the hallux with the same force and it's, it's quite subtle so you want to just push with the same force. Normally we would like to see some dorsiflexion but as you can see here when I push with the same force I'm not getting dorsiflexion and it is, it's not easy to push with equal amounts of force but effectively what that indicates is that there's potentially a functional hallux limitus present. I may not make the diagnosis of functional hallux limitus based on the test, I might want to look at some other things as well. What it means for orthotic prescribing is we need to facilitate that motion. What we don't want is perhaps an orthotic pushing up here that's going to restrict that dorsiflexion from happening. So we're going to make sure we have an orthotic that's got a much lower profile under the first metatarsal head, perhaps is cut back under the first metatarsal to try and get that first metatarsal to plantar flex so we can get the full range of dorsiflexion in that joint. In addition to the presence of a functional hallux limitus, obviously a structural hallux limitus or a hallux rigidus brings additional challenges. If there's a hallux rigidus present, obviously the joint won't move, so no orthotic's going to change that. So we're going to have to look at other interventions, perhaps like a rocker on the shoe or even a Morton's extension on the orthotic. If there's a structural hallux limitus present, in which meaning that there's some range of motion present, but it's still not a full range, that's sort of not quite, halfway between a functional hallux limitus and a hallux rigidus, an orthotic may help restore some motion over a period of time, 
but it may not in others. So we might want to look at a smaller Morton's extension um, or even a rocker on the shoe or even physical therapy to try and increase the range of that motion of that joint. This next test is the supination resistance test. The purpose of this test is to determine how much force you need coming from the orthotic. So if a huge force is pronating the foot, we need a big force to come from the foot orthotic. If there's a small force coming from the foot, we only want a smaller force coming from the foot orthotic. So generally what we need to do is literally take two fingers, put them under the medial side of the tail end of the killer joint, and try and just get a feel for how hard or how easy that foot is to supinate. And you can see I'm supinating it here. And on this other foot, I'm trying to supinate it. And it's, it's quite obvious to me that this foot's quite a bit harder to supinate than this, this foot here. Yet both feet probably look about the same. If this was really easy to supinate, a softer um, device is going to work fine. In those feet that are harder to supinate, we need a much more rigid device, um, a device that's much more inverted in the heel. But you can imagine, if this is hard to supinate, imagine what that's going to do to a softer device. It's going to flatten it and not achieve anything. So if supination resistance is high, the kind of design features we want to look for is we want a more rigid device, we want more medial wedging in the heel. If supination resistance is low, we can get away with a flatter heel and a softer device. Some products come with different um, modules, like this Interpod device, that can be replaced. And they, have, they are of different arch heights, so each one of those is going to provide a different force that's needed to supinate the foot. And one of the big problems with the supination resistance test is you actually need to do it to a lot of feet to get a feel for what's high and low. I can say to you this is high and this is low and you can feel it, but until you've moved a lot of feet it's, it takes a while to get experience and we're trying to work out what's high and low. We have our research equipment that we can use to give us the value in newtons, but there are various other products on the market like the Interpod Keystone device that literally pulling on it to supinate the foot and it will give a colour as to whether it's high, medium or low, and that colour can then be used to guide the orthotic selection needed. The next test is, is what's broadly known as Jack's test, and the purpose of the Jack's test is to assess the function of the windlass mechanism. Now the windlass mechanism is the body's natural way of supporting the arch. So when you dorsiflex the hallux, the arch should come up. And that dorsiflexion of the hallux happens as the heel comes off the ground. So what we want to assess how well that mechanism works. There are two parts to Jack's test. The first part is the timing and the second part is the force. Now with the timing we want to try and grab hold of the IP joint of the hallux and dorsiflex it. And we want to see how far we can move it before we start to feel resistance, before we start to see the arch come up. And you can see here I'm probably getting about almost 10 degrees of motion before I feel resistance. Now the importance of that is that we want the windlass to come on immediately when the heel starts to come off the ground. If there's too much dorsiflexion before the windlass kicks in, there's nothing supporting the midfoot as the heel comes off the ground. So as we have a slight delay here, what we might want to do is perhaps add a heel raise or add something under the hallux to dorsiflex it slightly so when that heel starts to come off the ground, the windlass mechanism starts working immediately. The second part to Jack's test is how much force is needed to dorsiflex the hallux. So once we've got some resistance there, how hard do you have to push hard to try and lift that toe up? If you think about it, if it's really hard to try and dorsiflex the hallux or, or lift the great toe, you imagine how hard it's going to be for the heel to come off the ground. If the huge amount of force is needed to do that, a huge amount of force is going to be needed to get the heel off the ground. So there's potentially a delay in the timing of of the heel coming off the ground. So we want to do things to try and lower it. Fortunately we know things like um, inverting the rear foot will lower it. We also know that elevating the lateral column, a forefoot valgus type padding will also lower it as well. So what we want to try and do is make the, with both these tests is assess the windlass to make sure it's working efficiently. We want the windlass to start working early and we want it to be easy. And we'll try and make sure the athletic facilitates that happening. This, this next test is to try and to determine what body plane the foot is most compensating in. There, there are several ways to do it, and ex a very experienced clinician will do it by just looking quickly. As you're learning how to do that, we, we generally need a business card and a pen. 
And what we want to do is mark with the pen the navicular, and then with the foot relaxed on the business card, pretty much mark the height of the navicular, and then if you just move that foot up, put the foot into its subtitled joint neutral position, and mark the height of the navicular again. And we call that navicular drop. That's how much the navicular has dropped between neutral and a relaxed position. While it's still in neutral, we will put the card on the ground and mark, hold the pen vertical and mark where the navicular is. Keeping the card in the same position, you have the foot relax and then mark, hold the pen vertical and mark the card again. And we'd call that navicular drift. So it's how much the navicular has drifted and dropped between subtalar joint neutral and relaxed. There's obviously a lot of reliability issues with this kind of clinical test. You know, trying to palpate subtalar joint neutral, marking the navicular, marking the card. So we acknowledge those um, issues with reliability. But what we want to try and do is look at the, the, the amount of navicular drift, the amount of navicular drop, and what we'd generally like to see is that they're about equal without being too accurate with the measurements. What we don't want to see is perhaps a lot more navicular drift than drop. So we don't want to see a lot more transverse plane motion than sagittal plane motion. As far as orthotic interventions go, if most of the motion is in the sagittal plane, i.e. there's a lot more navicular drop, the, the beauty of that is that something under the foot is going to be able to influence that motion. If most of the motion is in the transverse plane, i.e. there's a lot of navicular drift, something under the foot is going to have a less of a chance of influencing that motion. And you need to build, build things up the side of the foot. It makes it a lot harder. You need a wider orthotic for those people with a lot of transverse plane motion. Okay, the next thing we're going to want to do is determine the ankle joint range of motion and we primarily like to do that via the lunge test. The problem with the traditional way of measuring the ankle joint range of motion is it was done in a non-weight bearing position. We assumed that 10 degrees was the normal range, there was never any evidence for that. And we always used to push dorsiflex the foot to resistance and it was very hard to determine how hard to push when you're dorsiflexing the foot. So. In the late 90s, the, this lunge test was developed more, and since then, more evidence has accumulated for it, the lunge test, and it certainly has been shown to be predictive of injury. Now, with the lunge test, we, we do not worry about getting the foot in subtalar joint neutral like the traditional non-weight bearing way. It doesn't seem to make any difference. The test would normally be done with in front of the wall, but what, what we're going to do is pretend that my hand is the wall. So what I need you to do is bring your knee as far forward as you can until it touches my knee. And what we look for is what angles that tibia are at. We also want to look for how far away the foot is from the knee. And 9 to 10 centimetres is normal. And um, Apple have a handy app for the iPhone which actually has an angle finder on it. So we can place that on the front of the tibia to determine the angle. And that's about a high 30s. So we, 35 to 38 degrees is what we normally need. You can relax now. If people don't have that 35 to 38 degrees, we generally want to add a heel raise. But we also want to keep in mind that most shoes have, a, have some elevation in the heel. So it's often helpful to do the lunge test in the shoe to take into account you know, up to the one centimetre in the normal heel raise. The next test we're going to look at is the foot posture index. The problem with a lot of measurements and observations of the foot is that if someone has a flat or pronated foot, which measurement or observation do you use? Do you go by height of the arch? Do you go by the angle of the calcaneus? Um, someone may be pronated on one measurement and not pronated on another. Which one do you use? There's also issues where a lot of the measurements that we used to use have been shown not to be reliable. So that's why the foot posture index was developed. It's, a, it's based on observations rather than the unreliable measurements and it's based on six different components rather than just relying on one. The total foot posture index can range from negative 12 to plus 12, and each individual test gets scored from negative 2 to plus 2, with 0 being the normal, plus 2 being very pronated, plus 1 being slightly pronated, negative 1 slightly supinated, negative 2 very supinated. So the first one is palpating the head of the talus. Now ideally a 0 is when it's prominent, equally prominent on both the medial and lateral side. If that talus head was prominent much more medially, it'll get a score of plus one or, or plus two. And if it was prominent more laterally, it'll be a negative one or a negative two. Here, it's, a, it's about a zero. The next thing we want to look at is the height of the arch. 
If it's very, very flat, we're going to give it a score of plus 2. If it's very, very high, we're going to give it a score of negative 2 or 0 if it's, if it's in the normal range. And here we've probably got uh, an arch that's either 0, maybe negative 1. OK, we now want to look at the calcaneus angle. Obviously, we accept normal to be a calcaneus that's vertical. If that calcaneus was very everted, we're going to give it a score of plus 2. If that calcaneus is very inverted, we're going to give it a score of negative 2. This calcaneus looks pretty vertical to me. We're also going to look at the curvature above and below the lateral malleolus. Uh, for a score of 0, we normally expect that curvature above the malleolus to be about the same as the curvature below the malleolus. And obviously if we supinate this foot, you can see how that curvature has changed. If, I, if we pronate the foot, you can see it's become much more concave there. If we just relax it, you can see the curvatures are probably about the same in this foot, so it's a score of zero. The next thing we're going to want to look at is the, this midfoot area here. Is it, is it flat or is it bulging out medially? or is it much more concave? Obviously in a pronated foot, you're going to get quite a lot of medial bulging. So if this area here is bulging out medially, we're going to give it a score of plus two. If it's much more concave, we're going to give it a score of negative two. Here it looks fairly, fairly normal to me, so it's going to be about a zero. The final observation we're going to look at is the forefoot. Is the forefoot um, rectus, or is it straight compared to the rear foot, or is it abducted? Obviously in a pronated foot, the forefoot's going to abduct. So if the forefoot is very prominent on the lateral side, we're going to give that a score of plus 2. If it's more prominent on the medial side, we're going to give that a score of a negative 2 because it's a supinated foot. So for this foot here, we're going to end up with a score pretty close to 0 or 1, well within the normal range. We normally accept 0 to 4 as normal. Anything above 4 is pronated. Anything less than 0 is supinated. Anything above 10 is very severely pronated. Now, as to what we do with that information when it comes to orthotic prescription, uh, uh, this is a position, this is an alignment. It doesn't have a lot to do with dynamic function. So it, it's a very good teaching tool. It, it's helpful to, to break down the different components of foot posture to teach the students. We use this a lot as a, a research inclusion tool. So for argument's sake, we're going to do some foot orthotic research. We might only include people with a foot posture index above seven. That means they've all got a pronated foot, which means if they had problems, they'd probably get a foot orthotic. Okay, the next test that we're going to do is going to be the gait analysis and to do this we want them walking in the corridor and or on a treadmill and preferably we want the frontal plane and the sagittal plane view. As you can see here in the frontal plane we want to start at the top, we want to look at the head, is it straight? We want to move down at the shoulders level, then we want to look at arm swing, is the arm swing symmetrical? Is one arm further out from the body or, or both arms uh, functioning in, in sync together? Moving further down, you're going to look at knee position. Is there any genu valgum or any genu verum? Moving down, looking at the tibia, internally, externally rotated. Then we want to move on down to the foot. You know, where's the rear foot at different phases? Where's the rear foot at contact? Where's the rear foot at mid stance? Where's the rear foot during propulsion? We also want to look at the angle of gait. Is it abducted or adducted? Is there the too many toe signs, too many toes out on the lateral side relative to the tibia? We want to try and put all that together to try and come up, paint a picture of what the, what the gait is doing in the frontal plane. Moving on to the sagittal plane, we want to look at some similar things, especially starting down at the foot. When's heel off occurring? Is heel off occurring late? Is heel off occurring early? We want to look at the prominence of the joints in the midfoot, the arch. The arch collapse. Is the arch collapsing early? Is the arch collapsing after the heel comes off the ground? Is there a bouncy gait? at the ankle. Moving up, you know, when's knee flexion occurring? Again, looking at arm swing, is there some symmetry to the arm swing? So putting together those observations from the frontal and sagittal plane, hopefully they will correlate with some of the observations done in underclinical tests. We'll want to try and use that information in our clinical decision making.